Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate you coming to my talk today. My name is Leslie Hawthorne. I'm the Director of Developer Relations for Elasticsearch. And I'm here to talk to you today about what big data actually means for your business. Um, how many of you are currently deploying big data technologies? Excellent. How many of you are adopting the latest and greatest big data technologies because your CIO walked in and said, I need X? Oh, there are fewer suffering people in this room. That's always good to hear. OK, awesome. Um, what advantages do you expect big data to be able to provide for your business? Anybody? Cool, so we are all here for the hype. Awesome. I dig it. All right. So I think one of the most difficult things uh, in the conversation around big data is what the heck is big data really? Um, and we've all been hearing about big data now for eight-ish years. And quite frankly, I still think this is the best definition of big data I have ever heard um, because it is the only one which is consistently correct. Um, so as we, as we may or may not know, um, Excel had a limitation where it could only support approximately like 680,000 rows. And with uh, Office 2000, or excuse me, Excel 2010, Excel can now support 1,048,000 something something rows and a maximum of several columns. But the general idea here is for the longest time when we were taking a look at the data from our businesses and attempting to figure out what we needed to do to move our businesses forward, we were storing all that data in gigantic Excel spreadsheets, performing calculations, drawing very sophisticated charts and graphs. And it was all quite lovely up until the point where your sophisticated calculations and your beautiful charts and graph caused Excel to crash. And again, this is, again, the only definition of big data that I've ever seen that is actually successful. So here's the other problem with defining big data. Even our smallest pieces of data have big data. So on the previous slide, we saw a tweet, 140 whole characters. This is actually a map of all of the metadata that comes along with and is encapsulated in that 140 character tweet. Everything from the timestamp, the user's location, a bunch of really excited, exciting deprecated fields that are still included in the metadata of that tweet. And as we are consistently growing the amount of data that we produce, user-generated data and machine-generated data, this is all of the additional data around even the smallest data point that we're attempting to capture so that it provides insights for our business. So like I said, user-generated and machine-generated data mm -hmm. Anybody following at all around the discussions about like how many petabytes, exabytes, et cetera, we're creating of data per day now? No. It's pretty scary. We have a chart on the next slide, which is exciting because we like talking about charts and graphs. But the point is, every day we're creating more and more data. And this is both the data that we are generating through understanding our machine infrastructure, what our servers are doing, what our users are doing, content our users are generating, et cetera. And this is not a trend that is going to reverse itself. In fact, it's simply growing. And if you look at our beautiful chart and graph here, we're in eh, here -ish, in about 2014. And uh, Gartner is predicting that there is going to be an exponential spike in the rise of the amount of data that we're producing year over year. So this is the landscape in which we find ourselves. Data, data, data. Tons and tons of data is being produced. But unfortunately, we're at this really sad place. Um, we have been told that as we have more and more data, and we have are able to capture more and more data, that we will suddenly be able to make better decisions for our businesses. And that's wonderful. But unfortunately, what we're doing right now is we're really just storing data. We're capturing it all. We're hoovering it all up. And then we have a variety of tools to analyze that data. And we'll talk about it a little bit more in the course of this presentation, what some of those tools are. But the dirty little secret that most folks won't tell you is the super sophisticated, awesome people who work at their organizations as data scientists are using all of these tools, and then they are dumping the results of all of those reports. And guess what they're using to make their charts, graphs, and drive their business insights? Excel. Excel. Right. So it's wonderful that we're able to hoover up all of this wonderful data. It's wonderful that we're able to extract insights from it. But we are still using the same tool chain because our current tool chain is not giving us the results that we want, which is actionable insights. So this is what we were promised. Data from anywhere, get instant analysis of it, and be able to make immediately useful decisions for your business based on that analysis. How many people think this is actually how it works? Thank you, exactly. This is the reality. Um, in, you get data, and in order to actually make it useful to you, you have to spend a massive amount of effort actually cleaning it 
and making it useful to ingest into your big data tool chain. Um, I think a really great example of this is, uh, is, a, is a relatively simple one, actually. Like, if you look at logs, um, no log file looks the same as any other log file, because why would it? I mean, there's some generally uh, related stuff, right? You've got your timestamps, you've got your information, et cetera. But the fact of the matter is your Apache web logs do not look like your rsync logs, do not like your, look like your sys logs, et cetera. And if you actually want to analyze your log data, you have to do a whole bunch of scrubbing to just make it something that is useful to query and analyze. And that, unsurprisingly, takes time. If you've got a bunch of sophisticated tools and you're dumping out all of the results of all of your analytics and calculations from those tools, then sticking it into Excel and shipping it off to your data scientist, who may or may not be putting those things into Excel for you, and you're getting information back and it takes you weeks to understand your user's behavior, that's money that you've lost. That's insights that you don't really have. It's great to get information. If you get that information in weeks instead of in minutes, there is no way that you can react to the needs of your marketplace in a sophisticated and quick way. Um, I love this quote. There's a, this, uh, this is a gentleman I know of who works at a major Apache Hadoop distro, which will remain nameless, but he's a data scientist, and he says, I'm not actually a data scientist. I am a data janitor. Um, so I don't think that anybody really wants to spend a lot of their time cleaning up their data. We want to actually be able to understand what our data can tell us. So the big question is, why are we here? Um, I was fortunate enough to start my career early on at Google, and the promise of big data was exactly what that company was built around, and I have been hearing big data for a very, very long time. And if we've been hearing about this constant promise of big data, you know, we're 10 years into the Hadoop revolution. Why are we still here? And the simple matter is we've gotten really excited about being able to scale up and to be able to collect more and more and more information but we have done that at the cost of speed and structure. Um, how many folks were uh, able to attend uh, Andrew Oliver's presentation this morning on Hadoop? A couple of hands in the room? OK. So uh, you know, absolutely you know, no slam on Hadoop, but you know, looking at the elephant in the room, Hadoop, <laughs> Hadoop was architected for the needs of Yahoo, right? Yahoo put, put uh, Hadoop out into the world to make it useful for other folks and to see other engineers contributing to their project and their process. And while we all are very excited about the idea that we will be able to grow our businesses and that we will one day be mega hyper successes, to my dear friends in the room, if you think that one day your business will be a Yahoo, a Google, an Amazon, I suggest to you that I wish you the greatest of success in your quest, but that is likely not true. Um, of course, tell that to the nice folks who started all those companies I rattled off, and I'm sure someone told them it was not true, too. So we're basically architect architecting systems and big data pipelines that are meant to serve the needs of companies that are operating at scale because we wish to scale up at some point in time. But in the meantime, the tools that we are using were built for folks who had gigantic server farms and armies of engineers able to make sure that every time they needed to run a MapReduce job, if it failed, somebody could start it up again more quickly, kill it in process, that's great. Most of us do not have access to those kinds of resources. So where are we going? So your big data pipeline, this is an incredibly crowded landscape in both the open source and proprietary worlds. Um, I don't think I need to tell anybody in the room that if you uh, throw a brick at your nearest TechCrunch article, there will be a new, amazing, sexy big data tool available to you. Um, and again, the tools that we're using by and large and that people are investing in now by and large were not built for people who have big data. They were built for people who had massive, massive data. Um, and how many, anybody in the room able to attend Strata in New York next week, or last week? OK, so the Strata conference, and uh, it's also co-located with Apache Hadoop World, was in, held in New York City last week. And it is arguably the biggest conference focused on big data. And so reading all the news reports that came out of the Strata conference last week, there was a, uh, a huge theme that came out, and it was basically every single company was promising that they were going to make your life with your big data easier. It's going to be easier to process. The user interfaces are going to be more approachable for folks who do not have a programming background. Um, it's going to take less time for you to do all of your data processing. There is going to be less effort required on the front end to scrub and clean your data so that you can actually make it useful for the tools that you have purchased. So, this is where we find ourselves now. Again, 
tools that are, are going to be useful to folks who are operating in a smaller environment who wish to scale out, and making it easier for users to actually work with this so that you don't actually need to be a data scientist or a data janitor to actually make sense of your data and get actionable insights. So as to the proliferation of open source tools in this space, uh, when I ask folks why they think open source has, uh, is, is progressively eating the world of big data, um, I typically get the answer that people feel like it's really about a lower total cost of ownership, uh, which is a common argument for why folks would choose open source software. There's no licensing fees, et cetera. Um, I would actually argue that that's not accurate in this case. Um, I think lower total cost of ownership is really dependent upon not necessarily the software license costs that you're incurring, but it's dependent upon having the right talent. And Forbes in June of 2012 wrote up an article about the dearth of data scientists, or data janitors, uh, who are out and available on the market. And in mid-2012, 60% of the roles for data scientists these people who could make sense of this data tool chain and provide you with reporting and actionable insights, 60% of those jobs went unfilled two years ago. The projection was that we were going to be behind the curve in the ability to hire these people by 600% today. And it's only going to get worse. So if talent is not plentiful and therefore talent is not cheap, suddenly lower total cost of ownership is, is not really a thing that is useful for you. I'd actually advocate that the reason that open source has taken such a great hold in this space is because of its, it's purely because of its flexibility. Um, we, we, big data is a great catch-all term, but the fact of the matter is your big data is not my big data, is not someone else's big data. Mm, it all depends on what you're doing, right? So doing you know, search and analysis over images and doing image recognition is not the same thing as understanding user behavior on your website so that you can attempt to make a sale. But we would lump all of that information under the category of big data. So when you're trying to architect a solution that is actually effective for your particular set of needs, which are not anyone else's set of needs, but you have off-the-shelf tools, being able to modify that code, being able to do things behind the scenes because you actually have access to that source code that are going to make your life easier is absolutely a necessity. Um, a really great example of this, there's a gentleman who lives here in Raleigh. His name's Nick Everett. Uh, he's one of our most prolific contributors to Elasticsearch. He works at the Wikimedia Foundation. And these folks are actually in the process of rolling out Elasticsearch as the search across all of Wikipedia's properties. Um, and in about two months, uh, if you're hitting the English Wikipedia site, the search will be served by Elasticsearch. It's been rolled out for all of the other language wikis at this point in time. And uh, Nick and I were actually talking about a pull request that he had submitted a while back to us for an experimental highlighter plugin. And uh, it had not been reviewed, which as a person who cares about developer happiness bums me out. Obviously, I want you guys to get your pull request reviewed as quickly as possible. And it turned out that Nick had had a great conversation with some of our developers and said, this is the functionality that I require. And you know, obviously, it wasn't necessarily going to work for us, so that's great. It didn't get merged to master. Not a problem. But Nick was still able to create this highlighter plugin to serve the very specific needs that Wikipedia has around highlighting text. Um, I'm not going to get deep down into the nitty gritty details of highlighting and why it is a hard problem to solve um, for a wide variety of reasons. Uh, like probably the fact that like I know five reasons why it's really hard to solve, and there's probably like 83. Um, we live in a world where we have been incredibly spoiled by the fact that all we have to do is go to our browser and in uh, the uh, URL bar, type in some search terms, et voila, we get back a bunch of search results and there's highlighting and there's pagination and there's all this wonderful stuff and it looks very, very easy. When in reality, it's really, really not. So Nick was able to come up with a completely different architecture to do a completely different kind of highlighting, very different than the way Apache Lucene does its highlighting and Wikipedia is actually going to roll that out and run with it, even though it's never going to meet the needs of most of the rest of our customers or our users, so it's not going to be integrated into our code base. So, and the moment that you have all been waiting for, Elasticsearch and the Elk stack. So, uh, most people in the room seem familiar with Elasticsearch, a couple with Logstash, Kibana, somewhat. Um, let us examine the Elk stack from its many components. So uh, Elasticsearch is the company. It is also the name of our main product because we like to confuse you. Um, so Elasticsearch 
is our search and analytics engine. And you can also use Elasticsearch to store your data, although in general we advocate that folks uh, have a separate data store as well, uh, simply because we are deeply, deeply concerned about the health and well-being of our users' data. And there are enough corner cases in which Elasticsearch, which was not architected to be a primary data store, um, can run into trouble. We've addressed a lot of those issues with our latest release, 1.4. So if you are an avid user of Elasticsearch and you'd like to help us kick the tires, the theme of this re release is resiliency and finding those edge cases where we can potentially lose data. So please, all bug reports welcome. Download it, kick the tires. So Elasticsearch, search, analyze. Elasticsearch is your querying engine, right? Logstash is your centralized logging server, right? And it says data from any source, but you know, to some degree, Logstash is really great for stuff that bears a timestamp, right? And Kibana gives you beautiful charts and graphs and actual insights and shareable dashboards and all that other kind of amazing stuff. So let's walk through uh, a, a use case scenario for the Elk stack. And I'll use something that's relatively simple um, because we've all done it. So how, how many of you have purchased something using the internet? Excellent, many hands. All right. So let's say I am an e-commerce shop, and I have received a shipment of very wonderful green sweaters, and I would like to be able to make the maximum profit on selling my green sweaters. So there's a lot of things that I need to know. I need to know when do my customers like to buy sweaters? When do they like to buy green things? When do they like to buy things made out of cotton? When do they like to buy outerwear? Is it likely that they are going to buy this lovely green sweater in the middle of the summer? I advocate that the answer is probably no. So how are you actually going to figure out the answers to these questions? Well, fortunately, they are all in your logs. So let's start from the lens of Logstash. So Logstash is a centralized logging solution. You put a small forwarding agent on all of your servers that have your log data. They forward it all to Logstash, and suddenly it's all in one place, which is quite good because it's very hard to query information when it is in many disparate sources. It is painful. It takes a really long time. Your system will fall over. All of your logs centralized in a single location. That's great. Logstash will then scrub your logs, apply metadata, such as where they came from, uh, and it will uh, transform all of your logs into JSON. Excellent. We are now at the place where we can start querying using Elasticsearch. This is where you start asking questions like, sweater things, green things, outerwear things. When do people like to buy things that are green and are also outerwear? So you are able to get back the responses to these queries, and that is all lovely. However, the results are returned to as JSON, um, which is groovy. JSON is relatively human readable, but I propose that going to your marketing team and saying, here is a JSON document that shows you we should do this sale on Thursday at 4 PM is not going to meet with a lot of success, um, which, and we would like to succeed. So enter Kibana, where you can do charts, graphs, and dashboards that allow you to actually visualize the results of those queries in a useful way that's human readable. The human mind is primed for understanding pictures. right? That's why we have a cliche, a picture is worth a 1,000 words. Uh, and it's certainly worth a 1,000 lines of JSON. So excellent. You have run your queries. You have a beautiful dashboard. You can go to your chief marketing officer and say, we should do our sale on Thursday at 4 PM. And that's wonderful. Your marketing team can spring into action and begin crafting campaigns and banner ads and all of that other wonderful stuff. And they're off doing their thing, which is groovy. At the same time, you can use the same stack to actually understand things about your machine infrastructure. right? So obviously, if you are going to do a huge campaign and a promotional push, you want to make sure your server infrastructure is going to be able to handle the load. So you can then, again, using the ELK stack, look at your log data and understand historically what happened the last time we did a huge campaign of this sort. What was the machine utilization look like? What did our traffic spike look like? How long did the traffic spike last? If we pulled the banner ads, how long did it take before traffic stopped coming to our site? What was the impact on social media? And correlating those two things. So, excellent. Again, you can run those queries using Elasticsearch over your data in Logstash, visualize it in Kibana, and et voila, you figure out, well, looks like our traffic spike increases for about six hours, so we should probably spin up an extra three large instances on Amazon. That's great. Uh, we need to go to the right person who cuts the checks. Hello, wonderful human being who cuts the checks. Can we get money to spin up these extra instances? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Oh, and just so you know, based on historical traffic patterns, it looks like we're going to need them for about 
six hours, so we're gonna we're gonna keep an eye out, but we'll probably spin them down after seven just to save money on the cloud decks. Et voila, the mighty Elk stack for search, analytics, logging, and visualization. So that was a, a relatively interesting example because it's something that we can all understand. But this is actually um, this is actually one of my favorite stories about our product line. So I think that the power that we have now in big data tools and in the, the Elk stack in specific is data democratization. And what I mean by this is, again, we're living in a world where you tell folks that in order to understand what they need to do in order to be successful, what their next step needs to be, that they need to be a scientist, right? Or that they need to be a specialized analyst of some sort. And The Guardian has completely turned that on its head with this tool that they've constructed called OFEN. And OFEN is a purpose-built analytics engine that is uh, created on top of Elasticsearch using our APIs. And the idea behind OFAN was to give reporters in the newsroom access to instant information about what stories they were writing were trending, how long users were actually reading these stories, how they were interacting and engaging with the content on the page, and giving this information back to the reporters in, in near real time. right? And the greatest thing about this was this was a tool that became useful not only for The Guardian to understand what was going on with their competitors and where they were getting their traffic from, but it was also useful because reporters were literally able to go up to their editors in an extremely cash-strapped newsroom, because all newsrooms at this point are pretty cash-strapped, and say, based on the feedback I'm getting on this story, it's clear to me that I need to go out into the field and do a follow-up story on this particular topic. And yes, it's going to cost a lot of money for me to uh, fly to Jamaica and interview Russell Brand about his life without drugs, apparently. Um, but you know, clearly, this is a cost that we should incur based on the numbers and based on the data. And to think about the power of putting this tool directly into the hands of the journalists themselves and have them be able to advocate for getting a budget directly from their management and have them be able to do this within minutes, particularly in an organization like news where quite literally the news is as it happens, is an incredibly powerful tool. <coughs> incredibly powerful tool. Um, the Guardian has a really great um, technology blog. Their developers update like kind of what's going on behind the scenes with their technical infrastructure all the time. Highly recommend checking it out. Um, They've since moved on to additionally using uh, Elasticsearch as the background for OFAN. They're now using the whole ELK stack to do the analytics across their entire organization, not just for stuff like newsroom data, but also their machine utilization and infrastructure as well, some of the stuff we talked about. So that is the lovely Elasticsearch ELK stack. I have a live demo prepared. As we all know, live demos go very badly. So I have also prepared rigorous screenshot backups. <laughs> which we can all enjoy. Um, so my bread and butter for caring about big data is our community health metrics. Um, and what I mean by community health metrics is as a developer relations person, my responsibility within the business to use the terms of sales and marketing is the very, very top of the funnel, right? Um, when I'm talking to folks about what I do, I refer to my job as education and empowerment for developer and operations professionals who care about using our software. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is, obviously, it needs to have value to our business, or I wouldn't be in cool places like Raleigh talking to all of you today. So the things that I care about are numbers that tell me that our community is healthy, that there are a number of folks who are using our stuff, that they are succeeding with it, and the adoption numbers are always going up and to the right. So I care about things like GitHub, you know, how many people are starring, how many people are forking, how many people are watching these repositories. Um, I care about things like mailing list stats. How many people are subscribing to our list? How many people are unsubscribing to our list? How many people are actually saying something once they join our mailing list? Um, because it's really great if they're there, but if they're not engaged, they maybe might as well not be there. Um, I'm also interested in things like how are folks talking about us on various sites that people care about related to programming, like Hacker News or Reddit. Um, I'm also interested in our IRC statistics. Um, everybody familiar with the term IRC? All right, I see some nods, but I will define, for those who are not clear on IRC, um, IRC is a tool that caused me to waste many hours in high school. Um, it, was a, it's a, it just stands for Internet Relay Chat. Um, it's a group chat room. It's all very, very sophisticated. How many of you are happy users of HipChat? 
Okay, HipChat is just the new school IRC and it's really nice because it emails you when you're offline, which the old IRC does not, without some very silly, scary hacks that fortunately I have never done myself. So, um, I care about our IRC data because this tells me when my users are online, what they're doing, what they're talking about, what they care about, et cetera. So, let us look at this super groovy dashboard. All right. This is the part where Howard, my presentation gremlin, will doubtlessly visit us, but fortunately we have backups. It'll be amazing. Okay, so um, as with all good demos, this is running under the dude who works for me's desk on a really old server, so it's a little slow, but that'll be okay. So the interface you are observing right here, shown actual size, is Kibana. Uh, it's JavaScript-based, entirely browser-based. So these, again, are dashboards that you can share you can export, and all you have to do is give somebody a link to the data that you're viewing, and they can look at the exact same data that you're viewing, again, in near real time. So the options for data that we are analyzing currently, because I would like to load a very awesome dashboard. It'll be great. All right, cool. Um, so currently, we're monitoring um, our GitHub repos for Elasticsearch, Kibana, and Logstash. Uh, we're looking at our IRC users in a map-based way. So where are they located? We're looking at our IRC users by user, so information on each user. Who are our most active users? Who are the people who are answering the most questions in IRC? Um, this is incredibly valuable data for a couple of reasons, right? One, as an open source company, uh, we have a very traditional open source model, which is that we sell support and we sell training services. So if we discover that our employees are spending, you know, six of their eight hours per day answering questions on IRC, the chances that they are getting code written, pretty low. Chances that they are able to follow up with their customer support tickets, pretty low. We want to keep that ratio effective right, for our organization. We want to help our users win, but we don't want to spend so much time uh, doing community support that we aren't able to get our work done. And if we find ourselves in that situation, that means I have failed at doing my job because I have not given our community the tools they need to help each other and give each other a peer-to-peer -peer learning outlet. Other information. Uh, so Longstash World of Warcraft. So uh, Jason Kendall, the wonderful gentleman who built this lovely dashboard for us, is a World of Warcraft player. So currently he is uh, monitoring all of our employees' WoW stats and all the things we're doing in World of Warcraft, which uh, is a really fun project, which we are probably not going to look at today, because I don't know enough about World of Warcraft to tell you what's in all those lovely log messages. Um, we're also monitoring RSS inputs currently from Reddit and also Google Alerts. Um, we're going to look at what we can do with Hacker News in a bit, uh, and also data from Twitter. So as I, like I said, wasted an awful lot of time in high school using IRC, let's take a look at our IRC dashboard. So Kibana has many different ways to outlay your data. We've got your bar charts, we've got your pie charts, we've got your line charts, we've got your spark lines, we've got your histograms. We have your lovely little heat maps. Um, so this is actually showing us what's going on with our IRC traffic right now, again, in near real time. So um, interestingly enough, we have two folks in the Seychelles Islands who are apparently extremely excited about Elasticsearch, and that's great. I uh, will definitely make time to visit them and go to a meetup right quick. Um, here we are in Europe, and again, unsurprisingly to me, now that I have, uh, have moved to Europe, um, we see a huge heat map where folks are using us uh, let's see, it's 2.15 now, 8 p.m., yep. So everybody basically is finishing up dinner in Europe, and so they're all jumping online, and they're all doing all of the things, and that is absolutely groovy. So if we move to see what's going on in the other parts of the world, here we go. So lots of activity on the East Coast and in the Midwest, and some people in California are just thinking about waking up, and that's fair. It's, uh, it's 3 o'clock. Yeah, that sounds about right. Your average sysadmin is considering getting out of bed right now. <laughs> and as unsurprisingly entirely, it's about 4 a.m. in Australia, and no one is doing anything at all. None of this should come as a complete shock to you. So this also gives us the ability to zoom in on particular areas, because look at this gigantic spike. This has got to be something weird, right? This looks like nothing else. And we can zoom in, and it will show us where the traffic was coming from at this time all over the world. Again, and we can scroll and we can move. And in Kibana 4, you can resize these panels in a very sophisticated way. You are currently viewing Kibana 3. Kibana 4 is in beta, and it is pretty amazing. So if we 
zoom in a bit further. Here we go. So we're actually doing snapshots at five minute intervals. And the yellow lines show us where people are parting from channel or they've quit. And this is where people are joining. Can anybody tell me what happened here? Ding, 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 net split. Exactly. So it is very likely um, that the, like, a huge number of people all leaving at the exact same time, and then something that looks pretty much the same happening at our next snapshot interval that everyone's joining, it's simple. People have been kicked offline, right? That's great. But if I look at our log data from the time that we did our release of Elasticsearch 1.0, we had the exact same spike, just reversed. Suddenly we had a huge number of people joining our IRC channel. Um, usually our peak, peak user traffic is at around 600, 700 people. Um, suddenly we were up to, I think, 1,382. Yes, that is correct. I actually remember that number. That's awesome. Um, so, and then, you know, so we did the code release and everybody did the dance of joy and we all talked to each other and gave each other virtual high fives and it was all very lovely. And then moments later everybody left because unsurprisingly they were done with their virtual high fives and they were feeling good. And, we went back down to about the normal number of users, around 500. So this is the Mighty Elk stack shown here, actual size, giving me insights for my business that help me to love my developers and make their lives better. So that is the end of our cool and sophisticated demo.